Welcome back to module two. In this second video, we are going to be talking about the seasons. Now, the seasons is a topic that comes up in K through 12 science classes, but because it's not a large part of the curriculum, it often doesn't get enough time. And that's been long ago that we've probably forgotten. And the seasons is actually one of the most pervasive misconceptions in the general population um, regarding astronomy. So we're gonna make sure that we confront directly any misconceptions we have, and then we're going to go deeper in this chapter than you would have when you first were introduced to seasons. So even if you remember learning it, we are going to understand it better after this topic um, and this video than you might have before otherwise. Now, one thing we talked about in module one is that the night sky does change from one month to the next if we're paying attention to it. Constellations that were high in the sky in the summer aren't there anymore when we're looking um, in the winter skies. And that's because the Earth is going around the sun. But the other big annual change, the things that happen every year, are the seasons. And we need to make sure we understand why those seasons occur. So I want you to pause and think about any understanding you had prior to this class. What causes the different seasons on Earth? Pause and think about it. Okay. So the most common answer that people would give especially if they don't spend much time thinking about it, is option one here, that the distance between the Earth and the Sun is quite different in the summer compared to the winter time. And that is incorrect. If that was your first inclination, don't feel bad about that. It's pervasive throughout our um, society, but you do probably want to write that down, that this is gonna be a topic that you have to actively confront that misconception before you can really build a better understanding. It's like if you're trying to organize a closet, you can't put stuff in if the closet's completely full. You have to take that old stuff out first. So the correct answer here is option three, the tilt of the Earth's axis. And even if you remember that phrase, that the tilt of the Earth causes seasons, in our curriculum, we want to understand what is actually happening that the tilt is, is changing about our sky observable changes to our sky. The big thing that we can do to start to confront that misconception that it's the distance between the Earth and the Sun is thinking about the fact that when we are talking about seasons, we are typically referring to the weather, whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter. If we are experiencing winter here in Michigan, what season is it in Australia? If you've never thought about this, it's totally fine. But one thing we want to recognize is the Southern Hemisphere experiences the opposite seasons that we do. Australia has its hottest weather when we are in December and January and February. What that really tells us right away is that the sun can't be giving off more energy overall when we are experiencing summer because they're experiencing coldest weather. And we can't be closest to the sun when it's summertime because they would be closest to the sun but still be experiencing wintertime. That actually helps us, just that one quick reminder that the Southern Hemisphere experiences the opposite seasonal weather is one that will help us build that understanding up a little bit. Okay, so moving on. The key thing we want to recognize is that when we talk about the Earth being tilted, what we mean is that sometimes that same exact tilt where the North Celestial Pole, um, the North Star, Polaris, is being pointed at by the Earth's physical North Pole, as it goes around the Sun, as it goes around the Sun, that pole is still pointing at Polaris, always, the North Star. So when it is... Um, fall, for example, we're not pointed towards the sun or away from the sun, we're just pointed sideways. And so we get moderate temperatures here in the northern hemisphere. At the winter solstice, 
December 21st on our slide, it's always right around that time, we're pointed away from the sun. We've tilted the northern hemisphere away, not drastically affecting the difference, the distance. I really need to make sure we do not try to just change our misconception a little bit. When we tilt away from the sun, we are not that much farther away from it. There's a 93 million mile distance between us. Tilting slightly away is not gonna make a big change. But what it will affect is where the sun actually moves through our sky, and that's what we're gonna explore in this video. Okay, so winter solstice is when we're perfectly pointed away. The spring equinox, the vernal equinox, is when we're back to pointing sideways instead of towards the sun or away from the sun. And then the summer solstice is when the um, Earth's tilt is pointing towards the sun, tilting us towards that sunlight. These four terms are ones that are going to be useful to build into our vocabulary. Not to memorize them for the sake of memorizing them, but because they really are the four key dates in our entire calendar when we are thinking about seasons. The winter solstice is an extreme that we will think about. The summer solstice is an extreme that we will think about. And because the two equinoxes are in between those two extremes, they are the most neutral and most moderate of the changes that we're going to be discussing. Now, the two main reasons why Earth's tilt matters, why it's hot in the summer and why it's cold in the winter, is because when we are tilted towards the sun in the summertime, sunlight is more direct. It feels more overhead and sunlight being more direct means it is more effective at heating the ground. It is hotter, it is brighter when the sun is angled higher up. Just think about any time that you've been outside for a long period of time, the fact that it feels brighter and more intense around noon than it does around sunset when the sun is physically lower in the sky. But just imagine that difference being not noon versus sunset, but noon in the summer versus noon in the winter. And we have more hours of daylight in the summertime. In Michigan, that is a very drastic difference. And we've probably experienced it without really noting why that's changing. The sun's not changing its mind on how it moves through our sky, but it is being physically adjusted where it rises and sets, and we'll be discussing that too. So we have maybe up to 15 hours of daylight during the summer and maybe down to nine hours of daylight during the winter time. If we have the sun in the sky for longer, the temperature can stay higher because it's heating the ground for a longer period of time. And going back to the first point, heating it more effectively. So that's what we're gonna be exploring because I don't wanna just tell you these things and then have you memorize them without understanding them. We want to make sure we know what's actually happening that, that causes that. So when we think about direct and indirect sunlight, a lot of students can kind of confuse themselves in a way. But one thing that we can somewhat easily do at home is if we have a cell phone with a flashlight or a battery powered flashlight, just pointing it directly at the wall versus tilted at the wall when it is direct at the wall, the spot that you are lighting up is brighter. And if you have a thermometer there, it will get warmer. And if you have it tilted at an angle, the light spreads out and it is no longer as bright on any given spot on your wall. And a thermometer there would not change as much. So here on the left, we have the summer solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. And on the right, we have the winter solstice for the Northern Hemisphere. Now you can always come back to this in the posted slides or rewind the video, but I actually think that this pair of images is clearer for what we mean by direct and indirect sunlight. So this represents roughly what noon in Grand Rapids, Michigan would look like on the summer solstice compared to the winter solstice. At noon on the summer solstice in Michigan, the sun is very high in the sky. 
a portion of sunlight, that's what the one meter squared um, is telling us, a portion of sunlight when it is deposited on the ground is deposited on a small area, heating it really effectively. That same amount of sunlight, the same meter squared amount of sunlight, this is thinking about the flashlight idea again, in the winter solstice it's at much more of an angle and so when it comes down at that angle it spreads out to a wider area and so each patch of that wider area is getting less sunlight, it is getting less heating overall. You can see the same kind of thing when you look at, um, for example, sloped hills that are basically pointing towards the sunlight versus away from the sunlight. Or when we think about on a single day where we imagine there's only one temperature, there is a difference between being um, in sunlight and being in shadow. And that helps us understand that the sunlight actually hitting the ground does have an effect. It's not just the air temperature that we need to think about. So this pair of pictures is one that I took um, on campus. The first picture is from the third floor looking out um, at a small patch of uh, snow that had managed to survive because it was in the shadow of the um, walking uh, path. And then the second picture is going down to um, the outside and taking that same picture from a different angle. That's showing us that all of the snow around it had melted because there was just enough sunlight deposited to warm the ground enough. But the part that was in shadow was able to stay just that much colder, so even on a single day, the differences matter. The other kind of interesting thing is this idea of direct and indirect sunlight on a single day is why when you look at ski slopes in the northern hemisphere, they tend to be built on the north side of the mountain. And that is because in the northern hemisphere, our sun goes into the southern sky. And so it would be shining more direct sunlight on the south slopes than it would on the north slopes. And ski resorts don't want to spend lots of money making fake snow. And so they try to use the geography as best they can to build on the north side in the northern hemisphere. A fun thing to ponder is what might happen if we're trying to build a ski area in the southern hemisphere. There are plenty of those. What side of the mountain would we want to build on? All right, you'll think about that one. The second big reason for seasonal variations is that we have actively different numbers of hours of daylight during the year. And that is because the location of sunrise and sunset changes. We, we kind of simplify things to say that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But if we think about a compass, there is a single point that is due east and a single point that is due west, and the sun only rises and sets at that location two days out of the entire year, on the spring equinox and on the, uh, the fall equinox. If you struggle to visualize the changes in the sun's path through the sky after the images that we will see here and the diagrams that we're going to work with um, on worksheets, this site uh, in the slide here, it's a clickable link in the posted slides, it will be an interactive simulation that you can work with to better understand these changes throughout the year. But this picture is from our textbook and it's one that helps us at least somewhat start to visualize what's going on here. So the far left image is where the sun is roughly on June 21st. We see that that yellow circle, the sun is rising in the northeast and it is setting in the northwest. What I want us to try to do is not memorize those directions for the sake of memorizing them, but to recognize from our starting understanding in module one that the closer any star is to the North Star when we are thinking about the celestial sphere, the more time it spends in the sky. The North Star itself spends 24 hours in the sky. We talked about circumpolar stars and constellations and asterisms like the Big Dipper, which is close enough to the North Celestial Pole that it also spends 24 hours in the sky. 
if we have shifted the sun to be moving on a path closer to the North Celestial Pole, we have put it above our horizon for a longer period of time. Imagine the portion of the circle above the horizon compared to the portion of the circle below the horizon. On the two equinoxes, March 21st, September 21st, equinox means equal night. Those are the two days out of the year where every single person on earth experiences 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime because the sun is rising perfectly east and setting perfectly west. And then all throughout the six months leading up to and after the winter solstice, the sun is somewhere in the southeast and southwest sky, where again, Think about this as this trend. The farther and farther we get away from the North Celestial Pole, the fewer and fewer hours we spend in the sky. So at that extreme, we have a small path above the horizon where the sun is maybe above our skies in Grand Rapids for nine hours or so. And it doesn't get very high in the sky. Compare also how high up these circles can go based on that starting and ending point. Okay, so we want to confront a couple of misconceptions, and this is the first one. When does a vertical flagpole not cast a shadow in Grand Rapids, Michigan? So pause and think through what that question really means, and then which answer seems to best fit that statement. Okay, so first of all, looking at the options here, Option one and option two are very similar, but option two is at least saying, regardless of what our clock says, we need the sun to be really high in the sky if there is no shadow. So one, hopefully we ruled out right away with some critical thinking. Same thing with three and four. If we were thinking about which one might make more sense, we just talked about the fact that the sun is higher in the summer solstice and the winter time. And so if the sun is higher up, it can't cast as long a shadow, and so we should rule out four right away from critical thinking. Now, the really important part, and this is something that we may not have um, thought about before this class, is that Grand Rapids, Michigan is quite a bit far away from the Earth's equator. There is never a day in our entire calendar where the sun is directly overhead, casting no shadows. So we need to recognize that. In the discussion boards, if we want to um, talk about pictures where this does actually happen, they tend to look like poorly rendered video games. It's not something that we've ever seen here in Grand Rapids. The sun does never get directly overhead. And if we have in our minds that this happens every day, that's okay, but I want you, if you picked option one or option two, I want you on the next sunny day to go outside at noon. Don't look directly at the sky. That's bad for your eyes, but look at your shadow. You will have a fairly long shadow, and that's because the sun is not directly overhead, but it's over in the southern sky somewhere. Okay. This is a longer one, and I really do want you to pause and write down some answers to each of these questions. Describe the sun's path on January 1st. And if you need to, you can rewind the video and look back at those images. But consider the four questions on our slide as you are describing that path. Okay. Hopefully, if you haven't paused, you're willing to pause because it really is a good check to see if we're on track to try these answers ourselves before I am about to tell us. Okay, so January 1st, it is after the winter solstice. It is quite easily in our minds winter time. So January 1st is winter time. What that means is we are not getting a lot of sunlight and the sun is not going to get very high in our sky. 
if we start to imagine where the sun has to be for that for those things to be true things we experience every year in january what that tells us is that the sun has to be rising somewhere in the southeast because it isn't going to get very high in the southern sky and then it will set in the southwest as we go through the month of January into February and so on, we are getting the sun moving slightly higher every single day because we're already past that extreme point of the winter solstice. And because it is getting higher and higher in the sky, the compass direction is shifting closer and closer to east and west. The amount of sunlight will also be increasing as we go from January 1st through the rest of the winter time. Hopefully you understood and um, got at least some of those correctly written down. And again, I really want to make sure we understand that we should not be trying to approach this by memorizing a bunch of random facts, because then really what your brain is going to do is roll the dice and come up with either northeast or northwest or southeast and southwest. And maybe half the time it will be right without you really knowing why. And that's not helpful to us. So critical thinking is really the tool that we're trying to use to answer these. So in summary for this chapter, uh, for this section of the chapter, the two reasons why the sun changes where it is in our sky is because as the earth tilts towards it in the summer and away from it in the winter, sunlight is more direct or less direct. The angle that the sun is actually hitting the ground changes. And as we tilt towards the sun and away from the sun, we shift where it is on our celestial sphere to put it closer to the North Star and lots of hours in the sky or farther from the North Star and put it in the sky for fewer hours. Both of these effects are due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, but it is not enough for us to just have a single sentence statement in our heads about the seasons without really understanding why the tilt is doing what it does. The biggest takeaway that we really want to make sure we um, have is that seasons are not at all caused by a changing distance between the sun and the earth. So we'll be working on this more um, as, as often comes up um, throughout our semester. There are supplemental workbooks that you may or may not be using this particular semester. And these are the ones that are probably most appropriate for this section. So I will see you in the next videos.